Good morning, church. How are you doing? Where's the, we'll try that again. I mean, man, y'all were pumped up today. Man, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today, isn't it? And let me just tell you, let me catch you up on a little bit of what's happening in the life of Foundation Church. Last Sunday, let's go back last Sunday, we do an event called Easter Bash. Basically, we put all of our eggs in one basket, no pun intended. But we, that's what we do. And the goal for that event is called a Harvest Sunday. So we want to pray to God. We want to ask God to move in the hearts of people. We invite, we invest our people and say, hey, invite your friends, your family, your coworkers to that event because we're going to share the gospel boldly and proudly. And I get to stand up here, just part of the staff and report, seven people said yes to the Lord that day. <laughs> Praise God. And you also got to see people following believers' baptism. That's incredible. And it takes an army of men and women and teenagers and kids and anybody that's breathing, we're going to get you to work to do that event. It does, from the cook team that fed over 460-something people in 20 minutes. I mean, we're, we're, we're bumping Chick-fil-A time here with brisket, okay? With brisket, though. From the kids' volunteers to the preschool volunteers to the first impression to the deacons, our deacons here. Oh, my gosh, I love you men. Y'all are incredible. I'm telling you, they were, worked hard. And they did it in the name of Jesus, and they were happy to do it. And the best part is they're like, hey, what else is done? I was like, well, we got nothing else to do. Praise God for what he did last Sunday. Man, it's exciting. If you got your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 18. I want to say a number to you, and I just want you to marinate on that number. 1,994 Easter's. Think about that number for just a second. If you're watching online, welcome to Foundation Church. 1,994 Easter's. That's if the crucifixion was around 30 A.D. Think about that. And each year, you hear the same story told different ways to different people. But there's one thing in common. It's the resurrection. Jesus is risen. That's what's in common. That should fire you up today. But then comes Monday morning. Oh, no, dreaded Mondays. And you go, what now? What now? The challenge is not to preach a sermon that you haven't heard. The challenge is not to convince you that Jesus really did leave the grave. The challenge is not to come up with some creative idea to hook you or to convince you to come back. That's not it at all. The challenge is this. Monday's coming. Monday's coming. And how will your life be different? The real challenge is that Monday's coming and you're going to wake up with something. That's because you came today and you met with Jesus. Your life will be better. Your life will be better. 1,994 Easter's. People have been doing just that. They've been talking about Jesus and people have been listening about Jesus and then comes Monday morning and they wake up and the one thing that remains at the center of the story, it's the resurrection story that Jesus left the grave. That's what makes that work. And I want to go back in time to one of the earliest Easter sermons. If you got your Bibles, go to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And we apostles are witness of all he did through Judea and Jerusalem. Let me give you some background history right here. 
Peter is talking. Who is Peter? And it's not Peter Cottontail. That's not who we're talking about here at all. No, no, no. Peter is talking. He's talking to a guy named Cornelius. Peter is one of the first followers of Jesus. Cornelius was not a Jew. The Christians at that time were Jews. So Cornelius sent word, Peter, come over here. Come to my house. I want you to preach. I mean, I'd love to get that invitation. Hey, Rob, come over to my house and just preach. I'd love to. I got to get y'all to come here Sunday. I'd love to go to your house. So what did Peter share? What did he share? Was it the Easter sermon with Cornelius? Well, it may not have been preached on Easter, but it definitely was the Easter sermon. It really was. But just listen to the next part. It said, they put him, who's him? Jesus, to death by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him to life on the third day. Boom, there it is. That's the Easter sermon. That's what you need to know. Peter tells you all you need to know about who Jesus is and what he did right there. But then it goes to verse 42. Look at 42. And then he ordered us to preach everywhere. Say everywhere. Everywhere. To testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. He is the one of all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him, they believe in him, will have their sins forgiven through his name. Say Jesus. Jesus. Say Jesus. Jesus. Through his name. That last line is what I want to focus on today. Whoever believes in Jesus will have their sins forgiven. At the heart of the gospel is forgiveness. It's the reason Jesus came to earth. That's why we celebrate the birth of Jesus at Christmas. It's the Christmas story. It's the reason Jesus went to the cross. For the world's sin, for your sin, for my sin. So let's just define sin. So we're all in the same playing field. If you're watching online or you're in the room, let's all define it. Here's what sin is. So we're all on the same page. It's anything that separates us from God. Anything. Separates from you and me from God. It goes against his word. It goes against his will. It goes against his way. It's any way that we fall short against God's glory. God's glory. Basically what it does, it puts a wall up from you to God. That's what it does. It puts a wall up from you to God. And I brought a bucket. This bucket represents your life. Represents your life. And guess what it's full of? Rocks. And these rocks represent sin. All these heavy rocks that are sharp. These rocks represent sin. The sin of anger. The sin of addiction. Oh, here's one. Here's the sin of lust. That's a big one. The sin of envy, greed, gossip. This bucket represents your life, my life. All the sin that we do. All of it. Sin. Church, listen to me. Sin is the reason he came out of the grave that first Easter. For you and for me. So how? Sunday morning's message is going to help you Monday morning. How's it going to help you? How are you going to be different? Why is it even important? Why should you give me the next 30 minutes of your time to hear this? How will it help you wake up tomorrow morning different? Forgiveness is important because we all know the weight of it. We know the weight of our sin. When we do something we know we shouldn't. We also know the weight of our mistakes. Oh, I should have done this, but instead I did that. And then we also know the weight of pain. Real pain. When other people's sins or mistakes affect us. Or we also know what it's like to be hurt by someone else. Or the sad truth is we also know what it's like to hurt someone else. Don't we? And the only way forward is through forgiveness. We need forgiveness from God. We do. And then what we do, we give forgiveness to others. 
And sometimes we need to receive forgiveness from others. And this message is so important that it's regularly preached for nearly 2,000 years. In reality, forgiveness, biblical forgiveness, is one of the greatest needs every human being needs. Well, where did Peter learn this? Did he go to some seminary? Did he go to Lifeway and pick up a book on forgiveness or Bible study? Probably not. He learned this through life. Living with the Savior. Living with Jesus. It was in those moments living together that they found out what true forgiveness was all about. In fact, there's a story in God's Word that tells us where Peter learned this. Turn to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. It says, Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Seven times? Now before this, there was some sort of limit of how many times you had to forgive someone. That was the limit. Jewish religious teachers, they would teach this. They taught this, that a person only had to forgive someone three times. So if someone messed up, they did you wrong. They messed up and they did the same thing a fourth time. Oh, it's your lucky day. You could hold a grudge. Not, not that anybody knows how to do that here. No, super Christians. Perfect. But you get to hold a grudge. Not forgive them. So Peter decides, as often as we do, as, as I do, we think, well, you know, I'm going to be better. Just a little bit. He says, hey, I'm not perfect, but I'm way better than them. And so what he does, he doubles it and adds one. So if Jewish religious teachers taught you had to forgive them three times, three doubled is, we got a long way to go, guys. Three doubled is, and then you add one, there's hope for the future. Three doubled is six, you add one, that's seven. And Peter thinks, oh, I'm really doing something. Here we go. And then look at verse 22. Look what verse 22 says. It says that, no, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. 70 times seven. Peter tries that eighth grade math. It's sad when you're helping your eighth grader. And you and your eighth grader are both flunking eighth grade math. <laughs> Reality. Peter tries the eighth grade math, and what does Jesus do? He comes back with better math. Better math. You just know Peter's like 70 times seven can carry the one. That's 490. 490. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Peter, you're not listening. Not on the fourth sin. Not on the 40th sin. Not even on the 400th sin. You gotta go all the way to 490 before you can start holding a grudge. And if I was Peter, I'd be like, I'm done, Lord. I can't do it. 490 before you can judge someone? But God, I'm really good at it. Before you can condemn someone? That's my spiritual gift. 490 before you can say, nope, not going to forgive you. You're dead to me. You got to keep track. You got to take that little calculator out and tap it all up to almost 500 times. Now, let's just be honest. Jesus is not saying, he's not saying, if someone does you wrong 491 times, then you have every right to hold them against them. Mm, that's not what he's saying at all. No, no, no. What he's saying is, stop counting Stop counting. Stop it. Stop counting. There's a better way. If you're trying to keep track of 70 times 7, stop it. you got to stop it. But I know what you're thinking because I've been there. I'm, I'm there sometimes. I'm like, oh, no. But if I've got a new friend in my friend group and they're hurt my feelings, <gasps> and I've got a three-strike rule, three strikes, you're out, and they hurt my feelings, and I want to be like, you're dead to me. Bye, Felicia. I don't water dead flowers. You just walk away. And I got this. 
Or maybe you keep track of your spouse of every single time you forgive them. And you're making tally marks after tally marks of all the times you forgave them. Stop counting. Stop counting. Stop keeping track. Stop keeping record. Stop keeping score. And sometimes it's hard if someone does you wrong and you're just waiting. Because you're human, you're just waiting for that moment, that opening. Be like, oh, you done messed up, Aaron. I'm going to get you. Stop it. There's a better way. Forgive them. Forgive them. Stop counting. And that's what Jesus was telling Peter. And he did it in a way that Jesus is known for. He tells a story. He tells a story. Look at verse 23. 23. It says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who described... Let's start all over. Compared to a king who described to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had to borrow money from him. In the process, one of the debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He could not pay, so the master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, children, and everything he owned, to pay back the debt. But the man fell down before the master, and what did he do? He begged. He said, please, be patient with me. I'll pay it all. And then the master was filled with pity. With pity for him. And he released him, and he forgave his debts. There are two things we learn what forgiveness means. Remember, we all need forgiveness. You, me, we all need forgiveness. Whether you're in the room, you're watching online, you need forgiveness because we've all sinned. And Jesus came. He came to give us forgiveness. There are two things we learn from this. The first one, if you've got notes, if you've got your hand out, I want you to write this down. Forgiveness means I'm finally free. Forgiveness means I'm finally free. I'm finally free. The man owed tons and tons of money. Tons. Millions and millions of dollars. And he wasn't just running up credit card debt. No, no, no. The man went into business and he borrowed money from the king. And his business failed. And he didn't learn his lesson, so he did it again and again and again and again. Over and over and over again. You and I do this on a spiritual level. We do. We do this on a spiritual level. We've all gone into debt thinking we can do it on our own. Oh, I don't, I don't need God. I don't need to pray about this decision. Lord, I do it on my own. And Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, that they know they're spiritually bankrupt. And until you get into that place, and when you realize that you're spiritually bankrupt, you're unable to save yourself? Don't be mad at me when I say this. When you get to the point that you're not perfect, that you need help, until you get to that place, you cannot enjoy true forgiveness. You can't. And you may be there today. You may feel like there's nothing you've done, nothing that needs forgiveness. You might be thinking that right now, but maybe there's some of you here, I believe there's many of you, you're having a light bulb moment. You're realizing, man, I do need forgiveness. Because once you get there, you realize you're spiritually bankrupt and there's no way out. You're on your way to realizing what true freedom is. And notice what the king was going to do in the story. He's going to lock him up. But not just him. His family, his wife, his kids. See, forgiveness, true forgiveness, impacts not just you, but all those around you. Your family, your friends, your coworkers. Freedom from your sin will change your heart. It'll change your life. It'll change your destiny. Freedom from sin will change your home if, if you let it today. 
Second thing I want you to write down is this. Forgiveness means I am full of joy. Forgiveness means I'm full of joy. I'm full of joy. Just imagine how this plays out. The king decides he's going to call in all these people who owed him, all these debts they loaned out money to. And so you got Tom, who's over there. If your name's Tom, I apologize. Who owes him 200 You got off easy. Then Karen's over here, owes him 1000 And then you got this guy who owns millions of dollars. And the king says, that one. Bring him to me. And so in Scripture, what do the soldiers do? They go and bring him. It says that he was brought, brought. It's kind of like if I'm at the Chick-fil-A playground with my six-year-old, my two-year-old, and my two-year-old's standing up there like this, not letting anybody go down the slide. No. And I tell my six-year-old, go get her. Bring her here. She was brought. She didn't come willingly. She let everybody know. And just like that man, he was brought. He knew what was happening and what he could do. He begged, forgive me, forgive me, beg, please, don't, don't, no. And then what does the king say? The king says this. He says, listen, you owe me a debt that you cannot repay. You can't. You can't ever, period. In that moment, the man thought, I'm dead, I'm a goner. His, his life flashed before his eyes. I'll never see my wife, my kids. Get this business that can't ever work. I've been running. Gone. And then the king says, I forgive you. You're forgiven. Just imagine how that played out. The weight lifted off his shoulders. What's going through his mind, his heart. He probably yells, hey, honey, guess what? We can go to Ruth Chris tonight. You can get the big filet. I've been forgiven. He's telling everybody. See, there's joy in forgiveness. There's joy. The Bible tells us there's much joy. Much joy when over a sinner repents. We saw it last Sunday. We saw it first service. We saw it second service. There's many of you that you need to repent your life over to God. The Bible tells us this. There's much joy. There's also Psalms that says it. Psalms 32 verse 1. 32 verse 1 says, Oh, what joy for those disobedience is forgiven. Those sins is put out of sight. Let me tell you this. God wants you to be happy. He does. He wants his kids to be happy. Happy is when good things happen to you. That's what it means. Happy is when it's good and you enjoy it. God loves for you to be happy. But there's a whole other type of happiness. It's called joy that Christians have. That joy when you feel good no matter what happens at all. When you're forgiven of your sin, you're joyful. No matter what happens in your life, It doesn't matter because you've been forgiven. And just like that man who walked out of the king's castle that day, he's been forgiven like you've been forgiven. You're finally free and full of joy. Look to your neighbor and say, I'm finally free. I'm full of joy. But do you believe it? Say it like you believe it. I'm finally free. I'm full of joy. Picture that song in the Psalms. That picture's like a weight being removed. The word forgive in Hebrew literally means to take a load off. It's like a weight that's been removed. And here's important, pay attention to this. And a blessing has been put in its place. Now, if it was you or me in the story, we'd go out and party, have a good time. But what does the guy do in the story? Look at the next part. Verse 28. It says, when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him $1,000. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded payment. His fellow servant fell down and begged, said, please give me more time. Be patient with me. I'll pay it. He pleaded. But the creditor wouldn't. 
He had the man arrested, put in prison till his debt was paid in full. And then some of the servants saw what was happening and they were upset and they went to the king and told him everything that happened. And look at what 32, 32 says this. Then the king called the man in that he just forgave. And he said, you evil servant. What are you doing? What are you thinking? You evil servant. I forgave you of your tremendous debt. Because you pleaded with me. You begged for mercy. Shouldn't you give your fellow servant the same mercy as I gave you? And look at what 34 says. 34 says this. Then the angry king, he sent him to prison to be tortured until his debt was paid in full. And 35, pay attention to 35. This is what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse. Church, wake up. If you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters, forgiveness is a two-way street. It's a two-way street. If you've been forgiven, you have to forgive. If you refuse to forgive, you may not be forgiven. Mm -hmm. You will not know the true meaning of being finally free and full of joy. If you don't let go of all those grudges, let me explain it this way. I told you this bucket represents your life. Represents your life. And we've been talking about sin. And we said there's joy and freedom when you experience when you are forgiven. But the bucket's heavy. And you carry the bucket around full of rocks that are full of your sin. All the nasty, all the junk. And I'm not making a lot of sin. All the stuff that is heavy. That you carry around constantly and you just, you're carrying it back and forth. And it's making you tired. You feel it in your back. You feel it in your knees. And you can't go on. And you got to remember what the psalm says, that you are forgiven. It's like a weight that has been lifted. And for some of you, pay attention. You need to admit that you're a sinner. Admit it. Say, God, I admit I'm a sinner. Here is all my junk. I believe that Jesus died on a cross and rose again to save and rescue me. And in the best way I know how to turn my life to you, God, I commit my life to you. And when you do that, you mean it 100%. Your Heavenly Father will forgive you. And He makes your burden light. He makes it light. Just like the psalm says, that weight has been lifted. There are many of you, you need to repent and turn your life, put your life in God's hands. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, maybe that's you. Maybe you need to give your life to Christ. I'm talking to the men and women, the teenagers, the boys and girls who have not prayed and given their life to Christ. If that's you, you say, Rob, that's me. I want to give my life to Christ right now. You're going to openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved because it's by believing in your heart. And if that's you, you're saying, Rob, that's me. I want to give my life to Christ. I invite you to pray this prayer. There's nothing magical about this prayer. No, it's the attitude of the heart. It's the belief in your heart. That's what saves you. So if that's you, I invite you to pray this. You say, dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. 
Forgive me of all the sin in my life. I believe that Jesus died on a cross and rose to save and rescue me. In the best way that I know how, I turn my back on my old life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. If you just said that prayer and you meant it 100%, you just gave your life to Christ. So I need you to be bold. I need you to be brave. I'm not going to embarrass you. But on the count of three, I want you to make eye contact with me. And if you're making eye contact with me, you're saying, Rob, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. One, two, three. If you're looking up at me, you're saying, Rob, did you accept Christ? That's incredible. Praise God. Stay with me, okay? A family just accepted Christ. Praise God. Do you, you accept Christ? Don't want to leave anyone else out. Do you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior? What about you? That's incredible. Anyone else? Here's what I need you to do. There's a blue card. Can you grab that blue card? Just grab the blue card. Put your whole family's name on it. And a number that we can call you. Me or staff can reach out to you. Check the box that says, I accepted Jesus Christ. Can you grab that card? Will you grab that card? Check the box that says, I accepted Christ today. With all eyes open, maybe you're in a relationship with Christ. You have what the Bible says, assurance, you know without a shadow of doubt that your life is in Jesus' hands. And you're carrying this bucket around and it's not full of rocks anymore. No. Because God's forgiven you of your sin. But maybe it's full of somebody else's rocks. Maybe you're carrying around unforgiveness. I'm talking to all the believers in the room. If you're carrying around unforgiveness towards maybe your friends, your parents, your kids, your spouse, your boss, whoever it is, a friend, whoever hurts you, what's keeping you from carrying these rocks around? Because it's weighing you down. Believers, it's weighing you down. And just like God forgave you, you need to forgive them. But maybe, maybe you're the person in this room, you're saying, Rob, I know God's forgiven me. But I can't forgive myself. You can't forgive yourself, so what do you do? You put the rocks back in there. Like, God, forgive me for what I did last year. Forgive me for what I did to my kids. Forgive me for what I did to my spouse. God, forgive me for last night, for what I said or what I looked at. Forgive me, God. And he's forgiven you, but you can't forgive yourself. If you would love to have that joy again, but you can't because you're living with a bucket full of rocks. And you've got to remember, God's forgiven you and he poured out your sin. You need to forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. So you can do what the psalm says, that the burden is lifted. So here's the invitation for believers. With every head bowed, every eye closed, maybe you're here and you're like, Rob, that's me. I know God's forgiven me my sin, but my bucket's full of unforgiveness. 
Maybe God's softening your heart to forgive someone who's wronged you, who's hurt you. Maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's a person you haven't talked to in years. Maybe God's telling you, forgive yourself, stop it. Forgive yourself. I don't make mistakes, you're made in my image. You're perfect. I forgive you. Forgive yourself. Maybe you need to spend just a few minutes in prayer talking with the Savior. In a moment, we're going to open up this altar. We're going to sing. Maybe you need to actually physically get up out of your seat and come down here. We have people here on our staff, our pastors, our staff are here to pray with you. Maybe you need to go across the aisle, this is crazy, and actually forgive someone who's in this room. Maybe you need just to receive the forgiveness that God has already given you and walk in that forgiveness. God, you move how you so graciously move. Father, I just pray for the men and women in this room watching online, Lord. Break walls. Do what only you can do, Father. God, we love you. We thank you. If you'll stand with me, let us sing.